I admit it, I'm addicted to Desmos. And well, out of everything that I've ever done on Desmos, which is quite a lot, this is easily my absolute favorite thing. It's not the most complicated code ever, I know, but just having the ability to change the wavelengths, the amplitudes, and even the position of these waves to visualize wave propagation and wave interference is really incredible. The next time you read the news or start to get scared about something, just remember that we live in a time where we have 3D Desmos, and that makes it all worth it. More importantly though, there should be a link somewhere around in the description where you can go and play with this graph for yourself. But first, let me show you how it works. So the thing that prompted me to make this in the first place was when I was volunteering at the tutoring center, one of my fellow students asked for help with a double slit interference question. And I'll fully admit it, while I totally understand what's going on conceptually, you throw those equations in my face and I just, I don't remember how they work. Sometimes a quick three second refresher will help, but the problem that he was working on was a little bit more involved than that, so I needed something a little bit more. I offered to go through the derivation of these equations on the board with him, hoping that maybe that would also help me understand them better and remember them better. And it was at that point that he said, I'll just ask ChatGPT for help. So, yay, good job me. Way to, way to tutor those tutorees by just helping them out so much that they understand it and don't need to turn to artificial intelligence to, to do their homework. What, what such a good tutor I am. <laughs> So while he talked to ChatGPT, I just went through the derivation anyways, so that I could make this. And next time somebody asks a question about double slit interference, I am marginally more prepared. The first step is to recognize that since waves propagate radially, you're going to want to incorporate the distance formula somehow. Just like the function sine of x will tell you how far above or below the x-axis some distance from the origin is, putting this into the argument of your sine function will guarantee you that all points that are the same distance from your wave source are gonna have the same properties. Next, you're going to want to consider wavelengths and frequencies. As you may know, multiplying the argument of your sine function by a larger number increases the frequency, and multiplying it by a smaller number, of course, decreases the frequency. I myself prefer to work with wavelengths, I just think they're easier to think about than frequencies. And since wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, you can just divide by wavelength. We of course use lambda for that, and remember, the wavelength is just the distance from peak to peak. So we throw all that into a sine function, and we're off to a pretty good start. Side note, if sine isn't your favorite function, then I, I don't know what you're doing with your life, man. Like. Sign should be your favorite function ever. Anyways, of course, just like with a single variable sine function, multiplying it by some constant a out front will change the intensity of your wave, the amplitude. And so, just like that, we now have the ability to change the steepness of our wave, the wavelength of our wave, and of course, its position. So now, how do we animate it? Well, all waves have two components to them, the spatial component and the time component, which you just add on inside the argument. Here, lambda is, of course, still wavelength, and the omega is actually the speed of your wave. So if you go back to Desmos, we can go ahead and add in a minus omega t, add the sliders, and well, if we hit animate on t, making sure that it animates forward, then you should see the waves propagating outward. And we can change the omega, make them propagate faster by increasing it, make them propagate slower by decreasing it, or you could even make it propagate backwards by making it negative. Now what we're gonna wanna do next to stop it from being so choppy is make sure that t can only oscillate over one period of the function, so from zero to two pi over omega. Now, while the animation isn't as choppy, we do unfortunately lose the ability to control the speed of the animation with the omega slider. That's just how Desmos works. 
unfortunately. So if you want to make it go faster or slower, you just have to go into the T section and change the animation speed itself to, well, change your wave speed. Now, there is one more thing that we haven't done yet, and it's a rather important thing, and that is account for dissipation. If any of you have ever turned on a light or made a sound, maybe by like screaming at a chicken, insert shameless plug for one of my other videos right here, then you'll hopefully have noticed that the farther away you get from it, the less intense it is. And that is because most types of waves, and by most I mean pretty much every single wave that I can think of, follow what's called the inverse square law. You could try and argue that, well, since photons are particles, they don't dissipate like a wave does, but like that's they, they are waves, but they're not. That, that That's a whole different discussion to talk about. Just think about, like, the density of photons. But, you know, all that that means is that the intensity of your wave decreases with the square of your distance from the source. So what we want to do is divide our entire sine wave by the distance from the center. And remember, the distance formula is just that thing that's in the square root up there. So, distance squared, you're just going to write down the exact same thing, just without the square root. Now that pole that you see in the center that's jumping up and down is just a byproduct of dividing by the distance. Of course, you're not going to have an infinite intensity of a sound wave or a light wave at the source. Now, if you want to get rid of that, it's easy enough to just remove it from your function. But I find that with two or more waves, it's really nice to have it there so that you can see how one wave will dominate the other at a certain position in space. Kind of like with this pseudo sun earth moon simulation that I got going on here, whose derivation is left as an exercise for the viewer. Obviously, the distances and the relative masses are grossly inaccurate here, and I don't know enough about gravitational waves to say affirmatively if this is a good representation or not. I don't believe that it is, but nonetheless, it's still a lot of fun to look at and really interesting. You can see where where the sun's gravitational field dominates versus where the earth's gravitational field is the main gravitational force versus the moon's gravitational field. Of course, you can add as many wave sources to this as your heart desires. Waves are additive, so all that you have to do is define a whole other set of variables, another amplitude, another wavelength, another position, and then just add it on. It really is some pretty mesmerizing stuff to just sit down and watch. Like, this this is way better than anything Hollywood has been putting out nowadays, man. Because this is the language of the universe. Oh, and also, if you want to look at a double slit interference thing, add on this plane right here and then you can kind of see the peaks and the troughs. Well, kinda. Like, really, really, really kinda. I don't know, it's still gonna be a useful tool when I start tutoring again, man. I don't care what you say. Well, I care a little bit. Don't be mean to me. In, in fact, if you wanted to be nice to me, you could even click on one of these end screen videos right here. And if you wanted to be even nicer, you could subscribe.